um, what I would teach to the medical students, okay? I focus the testing more on basic mechanisms of action and some of the drugs, for example, that we'll talk about the autonomic drugs, some of the drugs that you will test or will be evaluated, will see, or excuse me, some of the drugs that you will actually will prescribe will, um, will basically um, uh, have properties. So they may have anticholinergic or uh, anti-adrenergic properties. So by knowing what, the, what that means by studying the other drugs, then that'll help you with this. So um, this is one of the things that we find in the states that have been going um, up for accreditation so that the psychologists can get prescribing rights. One of the strong things that we're able to do is basically say, look, you're getting, our students are getting uh, the same pharmacology that, that I would teach to uh, medical students. And uh, again, you will see medical students that do not um, have, um, do not prescribe a certain group of drugs, but yet they have to know all of those. So as I go through today and tomorrow, we're gonna to be talking primarily about general pharmacological principles. We're gonna talk about um, pharmacokinetics, uh, how that relates to actions, and we're gonna talk, talk about, um, uh, tomorrow we will be doing things about how a drug is approved. We will talk about um, uh, what the FDA does. We'll talk about how the FDA monitors drugs and how drug safety comes into play there. So from that perspective, we'll finish up tomorrow uh, looking at that. But today, uh, we're gonna start off with some basic general pharmacological principles. The uh, things that are highlighted in red are what you're gonna be uh, innately responsible for. So just like we have in the past, okay? All right, so let's begin. So when, um, when we're talking about pharmacology, um, what you need to know in general is, uh, and this is what we're gonna try to, you know, to teach you uh, and get you familiar with, is one, we're gonna talk about a number of basic pharmacological terms and concepts, okay? Those are gonna underline, uh, one, how a lot of drugs act, how a lot of drugs interact. Um, they're also gonna give you the vocabulary so that you can understand talking to uh, other clinicians about specific drugs. What we're going to do with, and I usually teach by um, class of action or mechanism or class of drugs. So for example, we're gonna do that in two ways. We're gonna talk about, uh, for example, um, how certain conditions that are being treated, the disease state. So we will have a little bit of review each time uh, in general in, uh, with regard to the disease state and how the drug is interacting with the disease state. So again, we'll have a little bit of a review from what you've had in your, um, um, in your um, uh, uh, clinical medicine course, okay? So we'll talk about how drugs act and mechanism of action will uh, include not only how do drugs produce their therapeutic effects, but we'll also talk about how drugs may produce certain side effects, okay? So the mechanism of action is going to be uh, important. Um, the side of action. This is an important thing that sometimes clinicians forget. And um, what happens is, for example, the drugs that you give, um, the, um, uh, the thing will be um, that um, the drugs that you give are going to act primarily, or the, the mechanism that you want them to act on is gonna be in the brain. However, when you give those drugs, um, we're not giving them directly to the brain. And this is a very basic concept, but surprisingly, clinicians sometimes forget this. So we have to be aware of, and part of the side effects are, is when these drugs interact at sites other than the target action, okay? So for example, um, if I'm going to, well, well let's use metoclopramide. Uh, we have GI doctors that use metoclopramide to increase the, the uh, uh, GI activity. Um, and they focus, and for a long time, I think I've used this example with you guys before, for a long time, their concept was, well, I'm giving it to treat the stomach. And we had people developing tardive dyskinesia. So we literally had to tell them, you know, and reinforce to them that, okay, we understand that you are using it to treat an ailment in the stomach, but the drug also gets up into the brain. And by getting up into the brain, the drug can produce tardive dyskinesia. So you have to be aware of that. 
some of the side of actions or side effects that we see are simply where the drug is getting at other sites of action. So that's one of the things that we need to, to, to be aware of. So where do these drugs act? How do these drugs act? Um, now all drugs, when they're approved, are approved for a specific indication. So for example, um, when a antidepressant drug is approved, it's approved for treatment, anti or treatment of depression. But what we may see is that, um, and what is happening is that the drug company has had to actually to, um, to present to the FDA that the drug is a this engine and the drug is safe. Um, and safety may mean that yes, some side effects occur, but it can be used safely or these side effects can be managed or minimized and so we do what is called a benefit risk, which means does the drug produce more benefits than it does harm? And every time you prescribe a drug, um, then basically um, that is going to um, be necessary for, um, for you to assess that because you have to determine what are the risks of this patient taking this drug? What are the risks of the patient not taking the drug? And how do we mitigate that risk or minimize that risk? And sometimes it is by carefully monitoring the patient. Sometimes by, uh, we can minimize the risk by keeping the dose low. Uh, one thing you see a lot of times ER physicians uh, in the emergency room, they tend to use larger dosages because ER docs are, this, are basically trained to fix, to basically correct the problem temporarily and move them on for someone else to treat them. So for example, sometimes they use, they may use high drug, high doses of drugs to stabilize the patient, but that would be something that we're not gonna use on a long-term maintenance uh, type of thing. All right, now another thing is contraindications. This, uh, when contraindications, the term is used, this basically means that the drug should not be used. That uh, most likely the benefit to risk ratio is not good. However, there are times when a drug is contraindicated and um, that drug is still used and can be used uh, successfully. So we have what is called um, absolute contraindications and then sometimes relative contraindications. Absolute, um, there's a couple of instances where you would absolutely positively never ever use that drug. Uh, one example comes to mind is digoxin, which is a drug used to treat heart failure and, and arrhythmias. Um, they're used for atrial arrhythmias, but digoxin we should never, ever, ever be given if a person has a ventricular arrhythmia. So we'll mention a couple of those, but a lot of times the point becomes is, what if you have a patient who is um, not responsive and is, um, is not responsive to any other medication and this drug works, but there's a high risk for it? Well, what we may end up doing is, we may use that drug, but monitor that patient a lot more closely. So sometimes with contraindications, you may see a drug used, and that's usually in a patient that hasn't responded to anything else, and that patient can, can be um, um, uh, basically monitored very carefully to catch any adverse side effect real quickly. The adverse effects we wanna know is that's part of your benefit risk assessment we need to know what are the um, um, what are the situations with side effects that occur? There is no drug that produces no side effects. Okay, you need to be aware that there's no substance. If it's going to have an effect in the body, it can have a, it can have adverse events. The kinetics. A lot of times with kinetics, what you will see is I'm going to put this on the chat board. Um, this a lot of times is described as ADME. And what ADME stands for is absorption. Um, let's spell absorption right. Distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Okay, so this comes into play and a lot of times people just talk about it. We refer to this sometimes as uh, pharmacokinetics. The real the definition is pharmacokinetics is how the drug is absorbed, taken up into the body, how the body handles it, where does it distribute to, um, how it's broken down, and then how it's gotten rid of. And a lot of times these pharmacokinetic principles 
can come into play with regard to um, both the therapeutic benefit as well as the side effects. So for example, one of the things we're always worried about is liver and kidney. So if somebody has liver and kidney problems, the drug can become toxic or produce some side effects because of what's literally happening is that the body's not metabolizing or excreting the drug, so it builds up and accumulates. So that comes into play. Kinetics helps us predict the response. We, it, it, it gives us information to tell us how the, um, um, how the dose or what dose to use and how frequently to dose. We also use it sometimes to, um, for example, we have products that have extended release or we refer to these as XL, extra long, CR, controlled release, um, XR, extended release. Um, um, sometimes it may be called uh, um, SL, um, which is a slow um, release or SR, I should say, slow release. These drugs sometimes are beneficial because it can treat the patient for a longer period of time and it avoids um, spikes. So it's almost like a slow infusion, okay? Um, so we'll talk about some of those with some of these products that come out. Uh, sometimes by giving a slow release drug, we can avoid some side effects um, because when you give a person with, anytime you give a person a medication, there's an absorption phase and I'll show you a graph of that where you peak up and then it comes down from there. And then one of the big areas that has become very, very interested um, and a lot of um, focus on is use of drugs in special patient populations. So in special patient populations, what do we consider? If you think about the, um, the traditional, this would include um, children. Um, one of the things that we see is that the, the age at which someone is a child is considered a child is uh, can vary. Uh, some people consider um, up to 21 um, as 21 and younger is a child. Some people think of children as being 12 or under or preteens. Um, we use the term adolescence, which usually is can be um, you know teenagers. Um, but we have um, but we can include special populations would include um, children, geriatric populations. Again. The definition of where the geriatric population begins, typically uh, people will say 60, 62, 65. Um, pregnancy, lactating mothers. Um, sometimes we have special populations that are ethnic. Um, we do find some drugs that may have some differences there. Well, you'll have a whole lecture in your advanced pharmacology on polymorphisms, but um, that's... Uh, we do recognize that certain populations may metabolize or absorb it differently. And we'll touch a little on that um, today. Um, so these, I mean, spatial populations can also be racial, black versus white. Um, so um, people with certain disease conditions may be a special population. For example, people in renal failure. So um, we, uh, when we have information about specific populations, now the FDA requires that to be, that the drug company actually put that in the label and include that. So that helps you, you know, if you know, for example, sometimes what we'll see is that a drug will say safety and efficacy has not been approved for use or has not been determined for use in children uh, 18 and under. So sometimes we see these um, uh, notations um, and it doesn't mean the drug can't be used, but what it means is the drug has not been evaluated. So we don't know whether the drug, um, you know, has any unique things that may occur there. So these are all pretty much things that we're going to sort of cover as we go through each of these classes of drugs um, this semester or this term. Now, some important questions, <coughs> excuse me, that we address in pharmacology. One is called structure activity relationships. Uh, this is referred to as SAR. Um, a lot of times in drug design, um, we will use this. So um, one of the things that we find is that um, drugs that have similar structures may have similar activities. So, for example, there's a drug that you may prescribe, which is called uh, Tegretol or carbamazepine. Car carbamazepine actually has a structure similar to a tricyclic antidepressant. So we may find that when carbam that we have to be careful when using carbamazepine because um, it may, if, if we use it with tricyclic antidepressants, uh, 
because of the similarity in structure, that may be um, an issue that comes up, that we may have some enhanced properties or ex exacerbated side effects. So structure activity relationships helps us sometimes predict actions, but it also will tell us sometimes that we can take the basic structure of one chemical and by changing the chemistry, chemical structure of that by adding certain groups or taking groups off or a combination of that, what we actually will find out is that um, uh, that can drastically change the, um, the action of the drug. Sometimes a simple chemical substitution may make a drug um, that is, um, the, the, the altered drug may actually be more, more toxic. This is one thing we worry about about street drugs is a lot of clandestine chemists will take um, molecules like amphetamine and things like that and start uh, changing them around. Things, uh, compounds in bath salts, some of the synthetic THCs, those are changed around and just by a simple chemical structure can make a big difference. Here's another example. Let me see if I've got, I want to check to see if this next slide is. No, I don't have it. Okay. Um, another thing is a steroid molecule. So there's a basic steroid structure, uh, ring structure that steroids all look like. Well, um, changing, for example, some of the side groups in that structure can make a change from a drug being androgenic or testosterone-like to being estrogenic. So um, this accounts for sometimes while we may get, um, you know, basically masculinization with certain steroids and we may get feminization with others. One of the things that we commonly see is that in some individuals taking steroids is that in their body, although they're taking an androgen, the androgen may actually be uh, converted to an estrogen. So instead of getting androgenic effects or the increased muscle mass and so forth that you see, what you may actually be getting is um, feminization. You may get things like gynecomastia. Um, another thing is going to be is route of administration. And route of administration is going to make a big difference. Um, the um, many times most drugs that people will take is going to be with um, uh, is going to be orally, but some drugs we can't take orally. So, for example, um, vitamin B12 um, has to be injected or, inje or snorted through the um, um, the nasal passages because vitamin B12 for it to work, this is cyanocobalamin, for it to work, it or for it to be absorbed, it has to be um, there has to be intrinsic factor in the stomach. And so people with pernicious anemia, they do not have that intrinsic factor. And that's why they become deficient is because that the intrinsic factor is not present. And basically uh, that intrinsic factor uh, doesn't allow them to absorb vitamin B12, which is why we have to either inject it or give it nasally. Um, sometimes people will abuse drugs by changing the route of administration. Very common thing is um, ADHD medications. People will... Um, uh, if you take them orally, then basically what can happen is you get a therapeutic response. Uh, people crush them up and um, snort them, then they're getting a higher concentration of the, of the drug to the brain, and they can get a euphoric response. Um, this happened with OxyContin. OxyContin was a slow-release medication, um, pain medication that worked pretty good for people that had um, chronic pain. Well, people started crushing them up and these slow release medications, you don't want to crush, you don't want to cut because they have a lot of drug that's to be released slowly. When you crush them, break them up, or if you crush and break them up and then snort them, then one of the things that's going to happen is that you're going to get a lot of drug absorbed. So root of administration will help us sometimes, for example, some drugs will not be absorbed. So we have to give them parenterally or intranasally or some through other, some mechanism. Um, other drugs, um, uh, we may change route of administration. For example, someone with severe nausea can't keep drugs down. So one of the options is to either give them an injection or another may be to administer it rectally as a suppository. Um, so the route of administration can help us sometimes and by changing the route of administration can sometimes create some problems. Sometimes we take advantage of like in management of chronic pain, we give a slow release um, medication that is releasing an opiate. And then when we have somebody, for example, are getting up and moving around, they have what is called breakthrough pain, 
then we use um, a uh, another medication to sort of add on to that during that period. Asthmatics, we do it. We have we give them something that inhibits their um, um, their asthma, but if they have breakthrough attacks, we give them inhaler, which ha handles that. And one of the things I want you to be aware of is that this uh, we do have, we talk about dose relationship, but what you remember is that these dose response relationships um, for various actions. I mean, so this there's different dose response relationships. So there's a dose response relationship for the therapeutic effect. And there's a dose response relationship for the side effects. So uh, different, and some drugs have multiple actions and we may actually see different dose responses. So for example, the main therapeutic action may be achieved at a lower dose, but to get another effect may be at a higher dose. And then the other thing we look at is um, we're interested in is basically um, how long does the drug um, work? How long does it take to start working? So we talk about the onset of action um, we talk about how long the duration of action occurs, and then we talk about how it's eliminated. And we, we've learned a lot over the years with regard to um, the, um, um, the other, uh, about all these products here, that we've learned that um, many drugs may go through different elimination rates, and we may choose a drug. For example, if we have a drug mainly eliminated through the kidneys, then basically we may want to... Um, um, if the person has kidney failure, we want to either use lower dosages or use a drug that may be eliminated more through that. And Kara, basically the uh, it's like the instant release ones are the ones that uh, typically are crushed. Now, the only exception to that is some of these instant release products. For example, if they have a candy coating on the outside, we call it an enteric coating. Um, you may not want to crush those because um, the enteric coating is usually there for one of two reasons. One is that um, some drugs may be broken down um, by the high acidity of the stomach. And so most drugs are gonna be absorbed in the, um, in the duodenum. But um, what we find is, is basically that the, um, um, uh, if you crush that, then the drug may actually be destroyed in the stomach and you may not get absorption. The other reason they use enteric coating, and most of you may be, a fair, be aware of enteric coated aspirin, um, the enteric coated aspirin is because the aspirin can cause gastric irritation. So the enteric coating is either to protect the drug or to protect you from the drug. So you don't want to crush those. Okay. Those enteric coated tablets also, sometimes people are trying to cut them in half. They do not cut well. So you prefer those, prefer not to do that. The rest of them you can crush and especially with pediatric or geriatric patients, or sometimes you have patients that have difficulty swallowing pills. You can crush them. And for example, with geriatrics, a lot of drugs, we may actually crush up and put it in applesauce or uh, mashed potatoes or something like that, which makes it easier for them to, um, to take. Okay. All right. Now, um, the other thing is that we, we need to, um, we want to look at, you know, we're talking about therapeutic actions. Unspecific are usually side effects or toxic effects. So that's what we see. Okay. Um, we've talked about site of action and we will talk about this. We're not going to go into real deep, deep molecular, but we will be talking about which receptors and maybe which uh, transmitters are involved there. We already mentioned mechanism of action and then um, pharmacology does address therapeutic and uh, contraind therapeutic indications and contraindications. And we will talk about, by the way, um, the, um, the way that, um, um, you know, these drugs produce these particular actions. Now, that leads us to this slide. And when we look at drugs, uh, these are some terms I want you to be aware of, because as we go through these terms, um, you know, you'll find with regard to these are things that um, are um, how many of the drugs will work. Okay, so one of the actions is a drug is an agonist. And let me give you a definition. Let me make sure I don't have that. Yeah, okay. So let's define these drugs, these, these mechanisms here. So an, a drug may be an agonist, and I think you know what an agonist are. I think you guys have had that. But an agonist is a drug that binds to a receptor and it produces a response. Okay, 
So it binds to a receptor and produces a response. Uh, an antagonist is going to be a drug that binds to a receptor, but does not produce a response. Okay. So, so for example, a beta blocker. So the beta blocker, uh, the beta receptor is normally stimulated by norepinephrine or, or uh, epinephrine in the body. And uh, when it stimulates, so the, so um, let's use norepinephrine would be the agonist. The antagonist would be a beta blocker. And so what the antagonist does is it occupies the receptor and it prevents the norepinephrine from getting to the receptor. So the agonist binds and produces a response. The antagonist binds, but the antagonist pretty much blocks. A lot of times we refer to the antagonist as being blockers, okay? Now, another way that a drug may act is it may activate enzymes. And by activating the enzymes, it sets off chain reaction, which can then uh, produce an action. Um, binding can uh, open ion channels. It can, if the drug binds to a receptor, a lot of times it'll open ion channels. On the other hand, we have some drugs that inhibit enzymes. Um, we have some drugs that will block ion channels, for example, calcium channel blockers. We also have drugs that inhibit transport in, uh, mechanisms. Uh, a lot of these include things like the SSRIs and the tricyclics. They inhibit the reuptake mechanism. And then we can also have, we're seeing some of the new, some of the drugs coming out that may actually um, inhibit some of the signal transduction proteins. So we'll point these mechanisms out, but these are the general ways that drugs actually produce their effect. We also see what we consider some unconventional mechanisms, um, drugs that may disrupt structural proteins. We see this sometimes in chemotherapeutic agents. Um, we do have some drugs that are enzymes. So for example, people that have pancreatic um, um, problems, uh, their pancreas can't produce enough enzymes, so we may actually use a, administer the enzymes to replace that. Um, another thing that can happen is but drugs bind covalently. All right, now this is a term. Does anybody know what covalent means? Okay, it does share electrons, but let's, let's move it to more of a, a little bit more basic thing here. Most drug interactions are going to be what we call reversible or competitive, okay? When we use the term covalently, they are sharing electrons. And what happens is it forms a permanent bond. So a lot of times when drugs bind to receptors or to macromolecules, um, most of the time this is a, um, a reversible or a competitive, which means the drug binds but then releases it. Whereas a covalent bound molecule it think of it as being cemented on there okay there's not many drugs that we want to bind covalently okay we don't really want we want the drug action to occur and then reverse versus when it covalently binds to it pretty much the drug sticks to it and doesn't release so we do have a few examples of that which i'll point out to when we get to them but most drugs we don't want them to bind covalently so anytime you hear the term covalently that's going to translate to, um, and I'm going to put it on the board here. Covalently is going to, let's see, that's fine. So I want you to think about covalently equals irreversible. Again, we have a few drugs that do that. Well, let me give you an example of this where that with uh, certain drugs that inhibit acetylcholinesterase acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. The drugs that uh, bind covalently, most of them we see them used as nerve gases or bug sprays. Because if you're gonna kill a bug, you want it basically, you want the drug to bind to it and not release it. Uh, and that's, that's what happens. But we don't have a lot of drugs that serve as covalent binders. Most of the drugs that we have will actually bind, irre bind reversibly. So they interact with the receptor and release it. Okay. We also have some drugs that react chemically to small molecules. We'll have drugs that, for example, may interact with things like nitric oxide. 
And then we have drugs that will actually bind free, free compounds or free molecules. Some of these are what we call chelating agents. We use them, for example, if someone gets a, an overdose of iron, then what happens is that the drug comes in and uh, traps the iron so it can't be absorbed and then you get rid of it. Now, the, you guys have had some discussion of um, drug receptors. You may not have thought about it as drugs, but uh, when you guys went through the autonomic nervous system, I know I went through it with you. I think Dr. Alhazun went through it with you. Um, and we talked about them, but drug receptors um, basically um, are gonna act very similar to what we see with neurotransmitter receptors, okay? So what we talk about is a drug receptor is where the drug or chemical interacts, okay? Now, there are some times where that we have what is called drug acceptors. So drug acceptors, basically what they do is they're going to, um, they're going to basically, the drug will bind to it, but it's not gonna interact with it in a sense. It's not gonna produce an action. So things like certain proteins, um, the well, drugs will bind to pro some proteins. Uh, when the drug is bound to the protein, it's not going to interact with the receptor, but the drug basically is, um, uh, is still there. And a lot of times these drugs, uh, when it's acting as an acceptor, it's not producing an action and it just simply is uh, holding it up. Sometimes with proteins, we may find that if there's a lot of binding extraneous proteins, we may have to give larger doses of drugs so that we get those protein sites um, bound up so that there's free drug that can interact with the receptor. And then just like with the neurotransmitters, we find that drug receptor interaction is coupled to an effector mechanism. So in other words, when the drug binds to the receptor, it's going to initiate a series of events to produce the response, okay? Another thing is that not, not every tissue in your body has every drug receptor. So sometimes we know that there are more, just like with the autonomic nervous system, where that there are some tissues that have primarily beta receptors, others that have primarily alpha receptors, some have beta receptors and no alpha receptors or, or minimal. That a lot of times can uh, determine selectivity. So for example, the drug may not have a lot of action. If there's only one type of receptor, uh, it may have primarily that effect there, but on another tissue that doesn't have it, it's not gonna have that. So our basic pharmacology links really to this type of equation. So a drug binds to a receptor, and then it forms a drug receptor complex. That drug receptor complex I have indicated here as a DR, okay? So basically this DR here stands for drug receptor. Now, so the rate of association, in other words, the drug that's at, when it's binding to the receptor, we call that the rate of association, that is K1, that's the term that's used. And so once the drug, and again, most drugs are going to react um, competitively or reversibly. So the drug binds to the receptor, that binding to the receptor is K1. And when it releases from that receptor, we call that the rate of dissociation, that's K2. So at equilibrium, when we have equal amount of drug there, basically what's going in receptor, um, when we've got the, the equilibrium established, you're gonna have the rate of binding is going to equal the rate of dissociation. So it goes on there, it binds and then releases. It binds and it releases. Some drugs are going to have the potential of binding and hanging on, and we'll talk about that. So those receptors have a stronger response than a drug that goes on and basically um, um, you know, releases. So it's sort of like, you know, you go visit your aunt, you've got one aunt that basically you have, uh, they walk by and they kiss you on the cheek. Then you've got those, you know, aunt or uncles that basically are grandmothers that they're huggers. You know, they grab a hold of you and hang on to you real tight. So the effects of the, of the hanging on with the hug is going to probably affect you more than somebody that just brushes, brushes you or kisses you on the cheek, cheek or pats you on the back. So what this happens is, we're, and I will 
yeah, let's cover, the, let's see, I think this, yeah. So let's cover these three points and then we're gonna take, a, um, take our first break this afternoon or this morning. So a strong agonist, when we talk about a drug being a strong agonist, basically what it means is that we get a real strong effect or a maximal effect, but it doesn't take, um, it only occupies a small number of the receptors, okay? So the reason for that is because a strong agonist binds to those receptors and keeps stimulating them for a longer period of time, okay? Whereas a weak agonist is one that takes a lot of receptors for it to get an effect. So um, we see the strong agonist, um, the drugs when we give a dose, we get a pretty strong effect. A weak agonist, uh, we have to give, when we give a drug, we get a light or, or a much less of an effect, or we have to give a lot of drug to get the same effect as the strong agonist. And then we also have what is called a partial agonist. And in this case, what happens is, even though we occupy all of the receptors, basically what happens is we still don't get a maximal effect. Or, or excuse me, we have to, yeah, we don't get a maximal effect. So basically what's happening is strong agonist, it just takes a few receptors. Weak agonist requires a lot more receptors. A partial agonist is that even if we get every receptor that's available in the tissue um, that's uh, occupied, we still don't get the same degree of maximal effect. We don't get the same maximal effect as we do with either a strong or weak agonist. All right, so let's take, well, let me cover the dose response curves. One more slide here. So what we find is we have two dose response curves and, and, and we'll just introduce these and then I'll come back. So on your left, this is a typical dose response curve. And basically what this indicates is that as we start increasing the, num the dose, basically we start seeing an increase in the response, okay? So that's exactly what we have here is that we have, we start down here, We start down here and we're giving drug and down here we're giving a drug. We don't have a lot of receptors that are uh, activated. And then we start activating a few receptors. And as we increase this, the number of receptors, the dose response goes up. And then when we get uh, here, you see it sort of plateauing off right here. What's happening there is almost all the receptors are located. So that's our maximal response, okay? The middle of this curve we refer to as the ED50 which is effective dose 50, or sometimes if we're doing in vitro, they may call it the EC50, which is the effective concentration. Um, a lot of times we may talk about the ED25 um, or the ED10, which means that um, that's when 10% of the effect occurs. We may talk about ED90, which is up here. So in a typical dose response curve, this is describing that as you occupy more receptors, you get an effect and then it plateaus out when you've got most of the receptors occupied. We also have one other type of response curve. And basically this is giving us an idea of what percentage of the population is responding. So typically what you see is um, that um, it's a bell-shaped curve and most of our patients we are going to assume are going to Lost my, lost my pen here. Most of the patients we're gonna see is going to respond somewhere close to that median range. Um, the ones that have that, um, that respond, um, the ones that are very sensitive um, are going to respond down here in this 5%, five to 10%. And um, so, um, but most of the population is gonna fit around this bell curve. We refer to that as a quantal dose response curve. Um, so that, these are the two types of dose response curves that we have. Most of the time we're talking about dose response curves with drug action, we're looking at this dose response curve, okay? So if I ask about a quantal dose, if I specifically say quantal dose response curve, that's the percentage of population that's responding. And typically, you know, we figure 95% should, should uh, I mean, what we're looking here is this 95% should be close to around this middle here. Okay, or we look at, you know, the bell curve describes about 95, the 5% on either side is the ones that are either, um, uh, you know, that are um, 
sort of the, the I hate to say the outliers, but are sort of a little bit of a different group there. All right, so let's take our first break. Let's come back at um, 10 after the hour and we will um, pick up on this. I'm gonna flip through a couple other slides while you guys are at break, but uh, yeah. So, okay, I know where I'm going ahead now. All right, so I will see you guys. Okay, what makes a weak part relative to the receptors? Um, basically, that difference is based upon how the drug binds to the receptor. That comes about with the chemical properties of the drug and the structure of the drug. So the structure activity relationship. Um, some, some drugs, um, the, their uh, structure allows for them to bind very tightly to the receptor. Other drugs, their structure is slightly off slightly different, which makes it more difficult for them to bind to those receptors. So the, the difference between a weak and a partial acnes. So actually, you're correct there. It's, it's actually the molecular conformation. It's dealing with the structure activity aspect there. Okay. All right. I will see you guys. Let's see what I'll see you guys at 10 after.
Okay, guys, we're back. And let's, um, let's talk about um, some of these components of drug action, uh, which we sort of introduced just before we broke down. So <clears throat> one of the terms that we use in pharmacology is drug affinity, okay? So affinity is really, uh, as one person described it, is sort of the tenacity at which the drug binds to receptor. So think of it like a bulldog grabbing a hold onto something. So basically, once the drug binds, how long does it stay on there? Okay, how long does it stick to the receptor? And the way that we measure that, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of drug receptor modeling that's done. And in drug development, when new drugs are developed, <clears throat> we do a lot of this in vitro to, um, to determine uh, this action. And then we relate it to, you know, how long the drug, how the drug reacts in the body. But um, when we talked about a few slides ago, um, remember this um, rate of a con rate of um, drug binding association and dissociation. So this is what we're sort of talking about. And what they measure or to calculate KD would be the uh, K2. Okay? That's the dissociation constant. Okay, so the idea is that we look at the drug binding to the receptor. <clears throat> That's it's associating with the receptor. And then what we see is, you know, how long does it stay on that receptor? When it binds to that receptor and stays on that receptor, it's going to um, keep stimulating. Now, most of the time, <clears throat> just like with neurotransmitters, when a neurotransmitter is released, um, there's a small amount of transmitter released. That transmitter goes into the synapse and it's floating around the synapse. And what it does is that it will basically, as it's floating around, it'll come into contact with a receptor. It'll stimulate that receptor and then it releases and it goes and floats to, um, floats off to basically, um, interact with another receptor, okay? So that same transmitter molecule may interact with a lot of different receptors, okay, in the synapse before it's removed, it's taken back up or whatever. Same thing happens, but what here with the drug, if it has a lower KD, which is stands for dissociation constant, that means that it's gonna stick to the receptor longer. And in fact, when we talk about some of the actions of antipsychotics and why some may cause tardive dyskinesia, that may be in fact be the case. So the point becomes is that these drugs with the lower, they will stimulate the receptor at lower concentrations because at the lower concentrations, they stick to the receptor, whereas, uh, and they're not being released to, to go stimulate other receptors, so they stick. And so what we see is more receptors are being stimulated for a longer period of time. And what we actually see is that we get a response usually at a lower thing. So we we'll often we talk about drugs with high affinity, um, basically tend to produce reactions or effects at a much lower concentration, and the response seems to be um, more um, uh, a stronger response. We often refer to stronger response because it occurs at a lower concentration. <clears throat> to measure the ED50, or excuse me, the ED50, which is the effective dose at which you get 50% of the response, basically that gives us an idea of the affinity of the receptor. So a drug with a low ED50 basically means that the effective dose occurs at a lower dose. If the 50% response occurs at a lower dose and that would be associated uh, or be related to a lower dissociation concept. So as we saw right before our break, the Dose response curve is, is sigmoidal. So Jason, that's a good question. The question is, does the dose response curve have to do with receptors occupied or observable therapeutic response? The answer to that is both. So, so the dose response curve sort of gives us an idea about the receptors being occupied and that should translate into therapeutic or uh, the therapeutic response or the side effect of uh, things. So it's really the dose, the idea is that the therapeutic response that we're seeing 
is related to the dose of the drug, which is expressed by the dose response curve, which is an indication of the drug um, binding to the receptors, okay? So this dose response curve, which is in a sigmoidal shape, this is really what you're getting to, uh, Jason, with your question, is that there's a relationship between the dose and the magnitude of the spec, magnitude of the effect, so the response. So here you see, as we start off with a low dose, we would expect not to see too many therapeutic effects, but as we increase the dose, we would actually see an increase in the therapeutic response, okay? Now, keep in mind that drugs have multiple effects. We look at, you know, a specific therapeutic action, but drugs may have different effects on different tissues and you have the therapeutic effect and then you have the toxic or the adverse effects that you see. And these, um, and we will see between different drugs that the drugs vary in effectiveness. You see this, you see in some individuals, you will see that some antidepressants seem to work a little bit better, whereas others, even though they're in the same class, have the same mechanism of action, they have slightly different effects. And the difference in that is often associated with how these drugs either get to the receptors, so it's sort of a pharmacokinetic issue, but it can also be a pharmacodynamic issue. When we talk about pharmacodynamics, that is dealing with how the drug is interacting with the body or specifically with the receptors. So um, the other thing is we might see, so some of the drugs, for example, that you guys will prescribe that at low doses we get can get the therapeutic effect, but as we start going up in doses, we start getting side effects. And this may be due to different affinities for the particular receptors. So for example, one of the side effects that we get with antidepressants, and we also get it with some of the antipsychotics, is orthostatic hypotension. And with orthostatic hypertension, what we know is, is that that's due to an, um, the blockade of the alpha-1 receptor. So we see that with some drugs, we don't see a lot of orthostatic hypertension at low doses, but as we start increasing the dose, we start seeing orthostatic hypertension. And that's because the affinity at the lower dose for the receptors, the alpha-1 receptor is lower, but as we increase the drug, increase the effects, we see a higher effect. We also see that, for example, with some of the antipsychotics used for antidepressants, that we will see some of them are more likely to produce effects, side effects than others. And that's due to the different um, sites of action or the, you know, when I say sites of action, it's not only, it may be different receptors and the different affinities for those receptors, okay? So when we're looking at these effects, we have to consider both the safety and the efficacy. And the question there, would this be an example of a drug being a weak agonist for the alpha-1 receptor? Yes. So a drug that is a weak alpha, weak, excuse me, a weak agonist for the alpha receptor, actually an antagonist, is um, what would be um, the drug having a weak effect on that receptor would mean that that's why it takes hard, larger dosages or that some drugs may have a greater affinity for it, and then therefore they would tend to produce it more frequently than another drug. So that's the differences, and that can be related often to maybe some differences in their structure. This concept of <clears throat> the difference between therapeutic efficacy and safety, or the, when these side effects occur, this is what we refer to as the therapeutic index. So that's the relationship between the um, effective dose, and I, I hate to use the word toxic dose, but the dose at which side effects may occur. You know, in an ideal world, we would love to see that the difference or the race therapeutic index was in the hundreds, okay? Which means there's a big separation between the therapeutic effect and when we start seeing side effects. A drug that has, you know, under less than 10 um, a lot of times that one is going to be, we're going to have doses that are very, very close at which you get a therapeutic effect and you start getting significant side effects. So the smaller the therapeutic index, 
the greater the risk for side effects at a given dosage. Now, another term is called potency. And potency, we describe this as it's the amount of drug required to produce a 50% maximal response, okay? So let's go back to this dose response curve. So for example, if this is our norm, so if we have a drug that is, All right, so we have, let's do dose response curve there and a dose response curve here. And they're supposed to be the same height, but I cut it off because my chat box here is in the right. So if we use this as uh, dose response curve A, we call the second one dose response curve B and the third one dose response curve three, which is the more potent drug. Right, so what we find is that, going back to the previous, or to the slide that we were on, the dose response, when it shifts like we did with A, a shift to the left is it's more potent. A shift to the right is weaker, okay? It's less potent, okay? So if the, what we find is, is that it takes less drug to produce, a 50, we use 50%, the ED50, because it's in the middle of the dose response curve. But we would anticipate <coughs> that a drug where the ED50 was smaller would be more potent, and that if the ED50 is larger, it'd be less potent. So here's a good example of it. So we have here, is if we're using, you know, when we look at the response, there's, we can use a number of things for responses. In this case, on this dose response curve, we're using a relief from depression. So what we find is that with fluoxetine, in this particular experiment that they did, is they found, this is the ED50, the dotted line is representing the ED50, okay? So, so um, in this particular case, what we find is, is fluoxetine seems to be a more potent drug than amitriptyline, okay? So um, now I can say that fluoxetine is more potent than amitriptyline <coughs> in this example here, or another way I could put it is amitriptyline is less potent than fluoxetine. So an increase in potency, it's a shift to the left, a decrease in potency, it's a shift to the right. And we've, you know, I mentioned the therapeutic index. Another term that's used is a therapeutic margin. And that's the relationship between the dose that produces the, benefic the benefits or the therapeutic action compared to the dose that produces toxicity. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, this doesn't give us the therapeutic margin because this is looking only at the relief of depression. I don't know from this graph whether there were any side effects or which drug produced the greatest degree of side effects. So this is simply a dose response curve dealing with the therapeutic benefit. But again, as I said with the therapeutic index, in the ideal world, we would want the greatest separation between the dose response curves for the therapeutic and toxic effects. So ideally, as I said before, is that um, if we have separation, if we have a therapeutic margin of like 100, that's wonderful. If we have a therapeutic margin of four, that's very, what we're gonna see is those dose response curves are very close to each other which means that it's very, it would not take, um, you know, very, very much change in dosage to get effects. And a lot of times these drugs with the, um, with the, where the therapeutic margin is very low, we will refer to those as drugs having a, a narrow margin of safety. 
that's the term that we see a lot of time, is that we prefer that these drugs not have. Can you think of a couple of drugs um, that would fall into that um, uh, that category? Let me answer, I'll answer Jason's question too, is that the, um, the dose response curve for heroin, there's two things that come into place. Is there, heroin is gonna be more potent than other drugs, but the thing that we're having a problem with heroin now in fact, I'm just dealing with a death case right now where that um, um, <clears throat> the problem was is the woman bought, um, a girlfriend bought heroin for her uh, live-in boyfriend. Um, it turns out that, they, um, that there was very little heroin and there was a lot of fentanyl in there. And so the fentanyl is one of those, would be one of those narrow margins of safety drugs. Um, and um, so what happened is basically the guy shot up and when he did, um, he passed out. Uh, this lady actually took a photo of him passed out, sent it to the dealer. <clears throat> the dealer told her to call 911. And instead, she then shot up herself and then passed out. And then when she woke up the next morning, basically, uh, he was dead. So, but the fentanyl, the heroin, there is a concept there with heroin. But a lot of things like on the street drug, what we're seeing now is a lot of fentanyl in there, which creates, then you got two drugs. Think about some other drugs that wouldn't be a street drug. <clears throat> you might think about a um, couple of drugs that would fall, you, you'll prescribe one of them. Many of you will. In general, the one that's causing the drug in particular, Jason, you, you got it, lithium. Lithium is one we're gonna monitor quite a bit. Lithium is one that doesn't take much for, the, um, for it to move it to therapeutic margin. The FDA actually considers that. Another drug, Ativan is not necessarily one. Um, the two drugs I had in mind that um, in particular, lithium you would prescribe. The other one is um, warfarin, the blood thinner. So getting back to Arnold, your answer, that is correct because most of these neurotherapeutic drugs, um, we're going to monitor the blood values to make sure they stay within a certain range because we know when they move outside that range, basically that um, it doesn't take very much movement outside that range for it to um, produce um, toxic effects. All right, let's see. This slide is transitioning and I don't know why it's doing it. So what we look at is one of the terms that we will see is what is called the effective dose ED50. And that's a dose at which 50% of the response occurs. Again, if we change this, for example, if you see an ED25 or an ED10 or an ED90 or an ED75, all that remains is the effective dose at which 10% of the response occurs. So if you if the subscript changes is um, typically we look at an ED10. <clears throat> Excuse me. For some reason my throat's getting <clears throat> real scratchy here. Sometimes we'll look at the ED10 to to determine uh, maybe the threshold of when it occurs and sometimes we look at ED90 to determine when it's sort of maxing out. But typically what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare drugs based upon their ED50, because that's right smack in the middle of the dose response curve. Another term you may hear, which in therapeutics we absolutely don't like to use, and that's called the LD50, which is the lethal dose. And um, this would be the dose at which 50% of the population dies. Now, on a lot of drugs, we determine the LD50 in animals. And that was to help us give some sort of index of safety. Um, we are not we are not requiring as many LD50. Um, I've done a few of these in my in many 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 years ago. And what you do is basically to to do these. Um, it's sort of the same thing you do with the ED50. You take a bunch of animals and basically you give them drugs, uh, give them different doses. So I would take one group of rats and give them 10 milligrams. Another group rat we get 50 milligrams, another group of rats would get maybe 75, another would get like 100, another get 150. And so if I was doing the ED50, let's say I was looking at their blood pressure, 
than you know every one of the rats in the 10 milligram dose, 50 milligram dose and everything, I'd me measure their blood pressure to see where the 50% response was. If I do the LD50, I'm doing the same dosing on the rats, but I'm gonna use a lot higher dosage usually. So, and then I did, then I can calculate how many, what dose it took to kill 50% of the rats in a particular dose level. Um, that's true, Jason. It's a very, very small blood pressure cuff, and it's hard to teach the animals to use their other paw. It takes a lot of training to get them to, uh, you know, um, pump the little cuff up and use the little tiny stethoscope. Um, actually, just for um, um, the way that you can do that is there's, they use a tail cuff in the rats, and it is a little small. It's uh, probably about smaller, about maybe half a, half the size of your pinky finger. So, uh, so if you're gonna do this experiment, if you're a rat, you prefer to be in the ED50 dose. So when you fill out the paperwork, we have the rats make sure they don't know the difference between LD50 and ED50, because they will check the wrong little, they'll all of them check the ED50 rather than the LD50. But one of the things we found with the LD50 data, it, it really doesn't provide us with a lot of, inf as much information as we used to think it does. So we have reduced, uh, the LD50s are expensive studies because pretty much you're trying to dose to kill the animals. So we don't um, um, do the LD50s to the extent that we used to before. And then the therapeutic index is the way they calculate it is basically they do the LD50 over the ED50 and that gives them an indication. So how do we do that now? Is instead of using the LD50, we might use a side effect. So rather than trying to kill the animals, we might pick a um, severe side effect and find out which one of the animals developed the severe side effect. And that can still give us the indication of um, safety of the drug. What we're really looking for is we're trying to prove that there is a, um, you know, the, what the margin is between therapeutics. Now, between the, the therapeutic effect and the um, toxic effect. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that A, the animal studies, uh, some animals respond differently than humans. So, um, so that's, it. that's one of the reasons why that um, we, we've limited what we can there or, or doing those experiments. So for example, here is the therapeutic index. So whatever the effect of the drug is, we see on the, um, computer is being very sensitive today. So whatever, so whatever effect of the drug is, so let's say if it was blood pressure, and this was, um, you know, the, um, the low effect, so a slight change in blood pressure to a big change in blood pressure. So on the, um, and then the dose of the drug went high to low. So we would determine the therapeutic effect, which would be in this blue curve, and um, based upon the ED50, and then we would determine what would be the, um, on this case, they used the dose response curve for the depressive effect of morphine. So what they looked at, instead of killing the animals, what they did was, uh, at which state did you get depressed respiration? And, um, um, and then you look at the dose at which there's analgesic effect. So in a rat study, what you would do is like, for example, you do a dose response and what they do is they do a tail flick. They uh, put the tail um, in a little groove and it's got a little, um, uh, laser light that burns the tail, you know, creates heat on the tail. So uh, when you give them morphine, you see it takes longer for them to flick their tail out from under the light. So you would determine when that flick occurred, that would be the therapeutic effect. Not when the flick, what, what you would see is that you would do a normal um, scenario where that we're trying to determine what dose we see the, um, so when you give them morphine, what's going to happen is they are going to have a um, longer time to move, from moving their tail. And um, so then what we're gonna do is that we're going to um, calculate what that is. Then we're gonna give them higher dosages to basically determine um, when their respiration is. And that's how we do those dose response curves. <clears throat> So the quantal dose response curves basically tells you whether they respond or not. The problem with a quantal dose response curve is it takes a lot more subjects and it doesn't tell you at which dose. You actually will take the data from, the, from the, these dose response curves to determine what dose to give for the quantal dose response curve. 
but um, you're tr it's true, this dose response curve would not necessarily pick up if there was differences in drug metabolism. So we both, we bas basically need both of those. <clears throat> so keep in mind that with receptor mediated responses, the action of the drug depends on the receptor that uh, in the target tissue. So one key point is going to be, so we know that if I'm going to have an antidepressant effect, let's say, then the action is going to depend on um, the receptors that are present in my brain, okay? Now, that brings up a component that that's a pharmacodynamic response, okay? But there's also pharmacokinetics because we have to um, also understand that the drug has to have properties so that it can actually get into the brain. Can it cross the blood-brain barrier in concentrations high enough to affect the receptors? So there are certain drugs that can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So those drugs, even in a test tube, may show great uh, receptor effects. We may find that those drugs, um, since they can't get into the brain, they're going to be useless. Um, so we, the, it's true that the effects of the drug are going to be dependent on the drug getting to the receptor and binding it, but part of the issue is going to be that the drug has to get to the receptor. That means, is the drug absorbed? In other words, is it being absorbed from the GI tract? We took it orally. Is the drug being destroyed in the GI tract? Or maybe the drug can't be absorbed in the GI tract. If we give it intramuscularly or, IV, you know, if we give it IV, the biggest concern is, yeah, we get into the bloodstream, but can it cross the blood-brain barrier? So those things that come into play. We also find that drugs, just like neurotransmitters, that drugs will bind to more than one receptor. Okay, this is part of that structure activity relationship. So for example, let's look at some, some uh, compounds that you're familiar with. Epinephrine. Epinephrine binds to alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2 receptors. So there's two receptors, and, and if you count the, uh, the receptor subtypes, there's four different receptors, which means when we give epinephrine, basically that all of those receptors are going to be um, interacted with, okay? And uh, now, a drug may have a higher affinity for one than the other. Um, let's take norepinephrine. Norepinephrine binds to alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1s, and very weakly to beta-2 receptors. So norepinephrine has a very weak beta-2 response, but it has a strong beta-1 response. So one of the things to keep in mind that it's possible for a drug because it binds to multiple receptors, may actually initiate a number of different actions. Sometimes we get specificity because we may see that the drug is more potent on one receptor than another one. And so from that perspective, we may actually um, see that. Um, sometimes we may not have a good specificity because the drug may be equally potent on all the receptors, so we get all of those responses. And the drug that tends to bind to more than one receptor, a lot of terms, the jargon for that is that it's a dirty drug. Because a lot of the early antidepressants, you know, the tricyclics, is they interact with a lot of different receptors. You have anticholinergic, you have anti-adrenergic effects, those can all produce side effects. So we prefer not to have a drug that can act on multiple receptors. Um, that is not our, that is not what we really prefer to do in most cases. This, tr this slide you've seen before, it is put in here mainly for a reminder. I think this slide and the next slide, you saw this when we talked about um, the autonomic nervous system. Let me just remind you of it. So if we wanna make this pharmacology, more pertinent to pharmacology, then what I want you to think about is up here where it says neurotransmitter, I want you to think about and just change the word to drug. So if we just simply did, um, let me just get a, so where it says, oh, that's a terrible color. I don't know why it ended up with that. <laughs> 
But anyway, what you would do is if, if you'd sit a neurotransmitter up here, if you put the word drug, so what we would have is the drug binds here to this, which is an ionic channel. And when it does that, it causes a conformational change, which opens it up and allows the ions to flow across. So we get a response, okay? So, so we also have over here, if we change the term into the neurotransmitter to drug, is basically the drug would bind to the receptor. It could activate the G protein, which could then um, activate intracellular uh, uh, messengers, which then modulates this action over here and allows the ions to come in. So the drug is acting just like a transmitter, okay? Just like neurotransmitters have specific receptors, drugs basically act on specific receptors, okay? Sometimes the drug's effect is binding to that receptor and preventing the neurotransmitter from working, such as a beta blocker. The reason your heart rate slows down is because when you take a beta blocker is because it is blocking the effects of the drug, of the transmitter, okay? So again, this slide was put in here mainly just to remind you from a standpoint of you've seen it before, as has the next slide. So here we have a beta, if we change this from um, you know, what I can't tell what the uh, compound is up there, but let's say this was epi. If we change this to a uh, drug like isoproteranol, then basically isoproteranol binds here. Um, it will stimulate the, the adrenergic receptor to stimulate the G protein, and that will cause an increase in the dental cyclase, which then causes the production of cyclic AMP, which then activates protein kinase and produces an effect on ion channels, okay? So like epinephrine would stimulate your heart rate, isoproteranol or other beta drug would do the same thing. And then we have acetylcholine, acts rate. So instead of acetylcholine, even though acetylcholine is used as a drug, in some we, we pick a drug, pilocarpine, uh, which is a cholinergic acid. And pilocarpine would basically stimulate that receptor follow through the same thing that we see here. And uh, then we have histamine. So again, this is going to act through the same mechanisms. The difference is instead of a transmitter up there, we're gonna have a drug. So when we use antihistamines, what's the histamine? Antihistamine is sitting up here, right? And that's, it's just sitting up there and it's preventing the histamine from getting to that receptor. So that's an antagonist. Now, when we are having Eddie, I'm getting some, uh, it, it, I seem to be getting a, a little bit of a drag here too. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think my slides seem to be jumping around a little bit. Um, because it's, I'm clicking and I'm clicking a couple of times because it's not responding. So, um, let me, uh, turn my microphone down and see if that helps. Does that help any from the, from the echoing? Okay. We're going to, um, what I'm going to do is we're going to take a break, our, our last break for the morning in just a few minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, probably in about 10 minutes. So if you can hang on to then, I will, um, I'm going to actually try to log in and see if that I get a better signal here when we do that and make the next break. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've seen, this is the worst I've seen it since we've started going to zoom. I don't know what's going on here. Um, so we need to be aware of a couple of things because a lot of times when we are dealing with receptors, we can have alterations of receptors. We can have upregulation, downregulation, which can affect the response. And this is particularly of significance when we are looking at um, chronic dosing for individuals. Okay. So receptor downregulation. And I guarantee you, you'll have one or two questions on this on the exam. So make sure you understand it. So what we're going to do is we'll cover upregulation, downregulation, and tachyphylaxis. And when we do that, then basically what we're going to um, we'll do is we'll take the break. I want you guys to look at it a little bit. And then when we come back, we'll answer any questions that you've got. So receptor down regulation basically is uh, sometimes it's referred to as desensitization. 
or refractoriness. Um, this usually, this is gonna occur when you've had continued receptor stimulation. So for example, someone taking a drug for a chronic period of time, okay? So what's happening is basically your body is pretty um, um, conservative from a standpoint when it comes to receptors and so forth. So if you are seeing a lot of, um, um, if your body is saying, okay, there's a lot of drug here that's stimulating uh, the receptor, I've got plenty of drugs, so I don't need as many, as many receptors. So what happens is those receptor numbers go down because there's a lot of drug there. And so I don't need all those extra receptors. So what happens is that when you take a drug for a long period of time, that what happens here is the effect starts diminishing. Probably the, um, the uh, best example of this is people that are chronic pain patients that as they continue to take the pain medication, basically what's going to happen is the same dose doesn't seem to produce the same effect. So as a result of that, um, basically um, people keep upping the dose. We see it with heroin addicts. They're taking it over and over and over again. Their body's not responding the same because they've developed up it. This can be clinically relevant, okay? A couple of things, for example, bronchodilators, people that are asthmatics that are constantly using their inhaler, one of the things that happens is those receptors that help open up the bronchioles actually become uh, downregulated, so there's not as many. So the effect diminishes, okay? We have to start using more rescue inhalers. From y'all's perspective, you um, may see this with SSRIs. You guys heard of Prozac poop out. Um, that's a good example of that. So, um, What's happening here is that basically the body is seeing so much stimulus that it doesn't need to have as many receptors so that the receptor number decreases, which means there's less places for the drug to interact with it. And that's receptor down regulation. Now, another term, <clears throat> although I will tell you, um, this is uh, in some of the newer textbooks, I've seen down regulation and tachyphylaxis sort of used interchangeably. But from the traditional standpoint, tachyphylaxis is that you get a diminished response after repeated dosages. Similar to what you see with receptor down regulation, tachyphylaxis is on You don't have chronic, you know, over periods of several weeks or months to do this. This will usually occur within a matter of minutes to hours. But this occurs a lot of times with what we call indirectly acting agents. And what an indirectly acting agent is, is one that is not directly re um, acting on the receptor. So it's, for example, releasing agents. So uh, drugs that will release the transmitter, what you're doing is you're depleting the, um, you're not changing the receptor, but what happens is the drug is acting by releasing the, um, releasing a transmitter, which then stimulates on the receptor. So uh, what happens when you give the drug repeatedly what'll occur is you deplete the, um, the neuron of transmitter. And by doing that, basically what happens is when, when, it, when the nerve goes to fire, you're, you're, not, you're out of transmitter. So again, with this one, you're not altering receptors, you're actually depleting the transmitter. This also occurs uh, on a shorter period of time than receptor down regulation. The other end of the spectrum is called receptor supersensitivity. So what happens is typically when you have um, the, um, there is a, a reduction in the amount of receptor stimulation. Um, for example, in a physiological state, it can be when somebody has been on an antagonist for a long period of time. So these receptors are being blocked and so what will happen is the body is like, well, I don't seem to have enough receptors. So what I'm going to do is make some new receptors. So what will happen is, is that um, you get an increase in receptors, which is designed to try to pick up the smaller signal. So with down regulation, so I want you all to think about this when we take our break in just a little bit. With down regulation, what we're going to do is um, we're going to, we're going to basically, um, look at um, less receptors, 
And with super sensitivity, we're going to be increasing receptors. And then with tachyphylaxis, what we're going to do is we're going to have a situation where that there is um, um, basically a um, depletion of neurotransmitter. So tachyphylaxis occurs quicker and is not, does not directly involve the receptor. Upregulation or supersensitivity and downregulation involve changing in the number of receptors. Okay. All right. Let's take our break and um, let's see. Let's come back at five after the hour. Marissa, I'm going to send you the four um, morning questions uh, in just a moment. And um, so what we'll do, we'll come back after the hour. I'm going to, um, um, when we come back after the hour, after, at, five or, at five minutes after the hour, we're gonna talk about some dose response curves and um, that will probably carry us into the lunch break. And before the lunch break, we will give you the short, the four test. And so we'll take some of the time to do the four little, four little questions. Uh, so you guys will have a few minutes to do that. And so uh, meanwhile, I will we'll see if I can um, correct my, see if there's anything I can do at this end, maybe decrease that lag. So I'll see you guys at five after the hour.
Okay, can you guys hear me? I logged out and basically came back in to see if uh, that would help. And we'll see. Okay, so you guys can hear. All right, so what I want to finish up with this afternoon, or not this afternoon, this morning. And Marissa, I sent you the, uh, the quiz so you can do the poll. And also I sent a video for the uh, for if you'll post for them for Moodle. So um, let's talk about competitive antagonism. And this is what's going to occur most of the time. So competitive, what we what I said earlier is basically most receptor drug binding is going to be um, uh, reversible. Okay. So that gives us an advantage in the sense that with the drug being reversible is that it binds and it can release. And it also means we can usually antidote it. So if we needed to change it. And so that's an issue. So with competitive antagonism here, we're talking about two drugs that are um, basically interacting at the same receptors. Okay. So the, remember that we have a, um, we have a finite number of receptors and the drugs are going to bind to the receptor. So what happens is typically um, with competitive and, and even with the drugs that bind tightly, they still release. So basically think about going to a reception and uh, your a family reunion. And so you're going from each person and you haven't seen, let's say there's 10 people in the room, you go up and, you know, hug aunt June. And so basically you hug her and she smiles, she feels good, and you release her, you go to hug Uncle Bert, and um, basically um, when you uh, go to her uh, to um, hug Uncle Bert, basically, um, again, you, um, you release, but when you release, basically what's happening is that um, someone else can come in and do a hug, all right? Um, now, the, um, and, and Marissa, I'll, sit, I'll resend that video shortly. Um, so basically as more and more people come into the reunion, you're standing around because your aunt Susie is hug, hugging uncle Bert. So you can't hug uncle Bert. So basically as more people come into the room and interact with the individuals, it's harder for you to do that's competitive antagonism. So typically, um, the, um, if someone is, you know, let's say you're on a dance floor with somebody and somebody keeps breaking up. Uh, you know, keeps interrupting you or, you know, saying, uh, uh, you know, tags in or whatever. So what we find is, is that when the drug binds to the receptor is that um, we can, um, the more of the receptors that are coming in, that means the chance of it interacting is greater for that. So what we see with competitive ant antagonism is basically Typically, as you increase the, the concentration of a drug, there's more drug molecules to interact with the receptor and it prevents the other drug, which has less molecules, there's less chance for it to interact. And we see this very common with reversible antagonists, okay? Uh, now, if we get the maximal effect, so let's say every one of your family members comes in then, and they're all occupying all the other people, then your chance, um, is going to be, you know, your chance of interacting is going to be minimal. So what we find is, is that it's just a simple mass action type thing is a finite number of receptors. You have two groups of, of um, compounds. You have an agonist and antagonist, both trying to interact with the receptors. And what happens is typically once whoever has the most is going to have a greater chance of interacting. So what happens there is the dose response curve is going to actually be shifted to the right. Okay. So it's going to take a greater number, a uh, greater amount of the drug to produce an effect. Okay. So I want you guys to think about this um, from a standpoint of um, uh, over lunch. And again, what I want to do is we're going to talk about this antagonism and um, for, for the till lunch, then what we are for a few more minutes then what we're going to do is I'm going to let y'all have some time to take the test. Marissa's got the poll up and then you guys can go to lunch. And then what will happen is I have a video that's about three or four minutes that shows about these receptor interactions, which I think will help you understand some of the stuff we talked about this morning.
let me go to the next um, slide here. Right, okay. So, hmm, must be just a blank slide in there. All right, so the types of antagonism that we have is, um, well, let's see if that slide. Yep, there's a slide that didn't get. You guys have, y'all have a blank slide there? All right, that's the problem. There's a picture of three dose response curves. All right, let's see if I can duplicate that. Is um, you have a, I don't know why it did not come on my slide here. All right, so one of the dose response curves is, let's get something, you, all right, you guys can see red. So we have a dose response curve that does this. There is a dose response curve that does, that is similar to that. I think there used to be a dose response curve that was like this. And then there's a dose response curve that's, that's like this. So do you guys have, you have these two here? All right, so let me explain these real quickly. All right, so those are on your slides. I don't know why it's not showing up on my slides here. All right, so these first two dose response curves are basically showing if this is our, if this is our original dose response curve of, of, let's say drug A, okay? And I'm just gonna label it A, all right? So we do a dose response curve, but now we put an antagonist in there, okay? And what I will try to do is, some of y'all didn't get it, maybe I can, over the lunch break is I can send this to you, or I'm gonna try to give you guys a video to look at tonight with this a little bit more. So drug A, we do this, and then we do a dose response curve. But now what we do is we give an antagonist. Uh, let's say we do uh, epinephrine, and epinephrine gives us dose response curve A. Then we do an antagonist. So we put a beta blocker in there and we're measuring heart rate. So the second dose response curve is A plus B. So that's the uh, epinephrine plus the, you can think of it, adrenaline plus the beta blocker. So now we have a competitive antagonist. The beta blocker is blocking the beta receptor, which means I have to give more drug A to get the same effect. So the drug cur the curve gets shifted to the right. Okay, you, you guys see that? So if I give epinephrine, I'm measuring heart rate. This is the dose response I see. But now if I give propranolol, propranolol is a beta blocker, and I repeat the dose response curve, then basically what I get is it takes more epinephrine to get the same effect, okay? So that's what that's referred to. This, and we'll just go back to this slide here. The maximum effect can be achieved if I use more of the agonist, and that's exactly what I do and the dose response curve gets shifted to the right. All right, so the other dose response curve that you have is one, you should have one that's not as high as the other ones and you should have one that is as high as the other one but it's real steep, okay? All right. So I'll try to get a sheet that's not on the slides and send to you guys at lunch, and then we'll go back over this at lunch. All right, so um, this one that is shorter than the other one, this is one that depicts um, where we have uh, covalent binding, because what happens is the drug binds to the receptor and it binds permanently, which means that we cannot get the maximal response no matter how much we give of the agonist, because the receptors are pretty much blocked out, okay? And then the last dose response curve that we have here is one with a steep dose response curve. So if you're looking at, this is what we see with a normal dose response curve. When we have a dose response curve that's like this, notice this one sort of lays out a little bit, which means it takes larger doses to get an effect. Whereas notice with this steep dose response curve, which would come up equivalent to the same height. Basically notice there's not a big difference between the dose to produce this small response when you see and, and the dose that ne needed to produce the maximal response.
So that's a drug like lithium or like um, uh, warfarin we see is what's called a steep dose response curve, which means that very little change in concentration uh, makes big changes in the response, okay? All right, so I'm not sure, how does it occur in snake bite? Are you talking about envenomation with a snake bite? Okay, so with envenomation of a snake bite, it's a little bit different because you're looking at a complex, um, um, and this was an area that I actually studied when I was doing my master's. I actually, part of the work that I did in my master's work was looking at detoxifying rattlesnake venom. So um, uh, what happens with snake bite is that um, the venom is a very complex um, combination of a lot of different things. And um, so it's when the, it's basically the, it's designed to not only kill, but digest. And so what it takes is that sometimes um, um, with that snake bite is that you're looking at um, the venom just is moving fast depending on the, um, it's there. So it's not really a drug receptor interaction. It's more of enzymes. And as you break down tissue, what's going to happen is the tissue starts releasing its enzymes, which means that the effect can move faster quite a bit there. So that's one th that's, that may explain some of that. It's interesting. I, um, you know, we have a lot of snake bites here in the South. We've been having more dry bites, but um, most of these are copperheads. And um, we also see the other thing that comes in with snake bite is it depends on um, actually how much um, venom is released. We see young snakes, um, tend to release more venom because, uh, and the larger snakes tend to be able to amount to uh, um, adjust the amount of venom that they do. In fact, we do have some dry bites, but the young snake is since it's small and it's, you know, it doesn't know how to do it. So it also depends on how much is, um, is uh, released by the venom. And it also depends on the venom because a lot of the venoms. See, the other thing that happens is the venom is breaking down tissue it's allowing more of the venom to progress there. So that, that's what I would explain it there. But that, that one is not really a um, um, true receptor drug interaction type thing. Okay. All right. So let me talk about one other, a couple other things before we let you go for lunch. And uh, one of these is that when we talk about these antagonists, um, I want you to be able to, to know these. Uh, so this tends to show up on the exam too. So be aware of it. So when we talk about pharmacological antagonism, that means that basically that the drug and the antagonist are going to be acting at the same receptor site. A couple of examples. We have histamine, which is when somebody, you know, um, gets stung by a bee, it releases, and this is another thing, uh, Arnold, is that when you get these snake bites, you get a lot of, of endogenous things that are being released, and as they're being released, it exemplifies, or it basically amplifies and exacerbates the uh, response that you see. So for example, somebody gets an uh, allergy. So you're exposed to your, you know, your cat um, or somebody's cat, you're allergic to it, that releases histamine. So what do we use to treat it? We use diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And so what we're doing here is histamine is stimulating the histamine one receptor. Diphenhydramine is going to block the histamine receptor. So we give a dose of diphenhydramine, so we have more diphenhydramine molecules than we have with histamine, okay? Um, somebody that is stressed uh, releases a lot of epinephrine, and so it is stimulating the heart to beat faster, beat harder, and how do we slow it down is we give a drug called propranolol. And what propranolol does is propranolol basically blocks the beta receptor, and we give a dose high enough that it is more than the more there there's more propranolol there than there's epinephrine so that beta blocker is keeping the epinephrine from getting to the receptor all right so here we have the agonist is histamine or epinephrine the antagonist is diphenhydramine or propranolol that's a pharmacological antagonism you're blocking at the same receptor that's being stimulated physiological antagonism is a little different so what's going to happen here is that you're using two opposing sites, two opposing physiological effects. So when a person gets stung by a bee, we get release of histamine. Histamine is the agonist. And histamine can cause your bronchioles to constrict so you can't breathe. Um, 
So what we give is epinephrine. So epinephrine stimulates the beta-2 receptors in the bronchioles, which causes them to vasodilate. So with physiological antagonism, note two things. Number one, we are acting at two different sites. And number two, we're actually using two agonists. So we're using two different physiological mechanisms. Uh, we're opposing one effect by using a different physiological mechanism. Histamine is stimulating histamine receptors, epinephrine is stimulating beta-2 receptors. All right, so that's physiological and pharmacological. We also have chemical. So chemical is really a chemical reaction. And what would be a good example of a chemical reaction, what happens is substances combine in a solution and you get a diminished drug response or a diminished response. Um, think about antacids. So antacids aren't acting on receptors. What's happening is you're generating, your body's generating a lot of hydrochloric acid. So you get an acidic stomach. So what we do is we put in an antacid, which combines with the acid in your stomach to neutralize it. Okay, not working on a receptor. Um, but what it is doing is it's basically having a chemical reaction, um, same chemical reaction if we put an antacid and acid together in a test tube, where the test tube is your stomach. And uh, basically, so those are acting there. And then another type of antagonism, which can be very important with regard to drug actions, is pharmacokinetics. And so what happens is, there are things that interfere with the drug getting to the active site, okay? And this can be, so for example, drugs can alter the metabolism. We have drugs that will inhibit the metabolism of another drug, and so that can produce an effect. Um, things that inhibit the absorption or excretion, things that, drugs that either interfere with the absorption. So for example, antacids can interfere with the absorption of some drugs. Um, some drugs can um, interfere with renal function, so it prevents the excretion. And then another big thing we have is drugs can interfere with protein binding. We're going to go through all of these different examples as we go through uh, things today. We're going to go back through this uh, in more detail, but we're also going to talk about it when we get to the individual drugs that's um, with, with that occurring. And let's see. Yeah, let's stop with these. Um, antagonist, um, and we'll pick up with the additive and synergistic and potentiation effects after lunch. So let me um, take a minute here to explain to you what I need you to do. Number one is after I finish talking, Marissa will put up the poll for the uh, exams and Marissa, there's or for the four question morning thing. So Marissa, um, they should be able to finish that in about 20 minutes. Um, there are four simple questions. And again, you're just you're not being graded as a grade. It's being graded as, you know, that you've done it. Um, and it covers some of the stuff that I've talked about this morning. Uh, the other thing is when you go to lunch, there's a, Marissa's going to post a video, which is um, about four minutes, which is a, um, a characterization of the, pro of the agonist binding and so forth, which I think will be helpful to you to see that. Um, the third thing, just let me mention real quick, is some of you always ask about a textbooks, textbook, and when we get back from lunch, if you will remind me, I will give you, there's no textbook required, but I will give you uh, two or three uh, potential textbooks that you might, if you need a textbook or want a textbook that you might want to use. So um, I'll do that when we get back from lunch. And um, anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, so remember to take the exam. She's going to put that up. Marissa, as soon as I sign off, I am going to, um, send you the video link. Um, Eddie, I'm not sure what is the best PEP study guide. I will try to find that out for you. Um, if you will send me an email, I'll ask around if there is one. I have done some PEP, stu some PEP study, uh, courses while, but I think Judy, Steinem has been doing some, and I will check with her this next week to see if she has any recommendations also. But if you will send me an email, that'll make sure I remember it. Okay. All right. Anybody have any other questions? If not, I will um, see you guys at one o'clock. And Marissa, I'm going to send you that email uh, with the video right now. Don't forget to take the quiz before you sign off. <laughs>